We are frequently asked to cover the intriguing ancient documents of ancient Sumeria, and for good reason. For although the Sumerian King List is officially classified as an accurate and important chronographic document from ancient Mesopotamia, the lifespans of many of the oldest of its rulers are stated as having lived for upwards of 30,000 years. Furthermore, there is a noticeable steady decline in the duration of these rulers' lives. This gradual decline, when seen in its complete translated form, if, of course, it is indeed an accurate documentation of history, displays a clear example of devolution over many thousands of years. It lists a long succession of cities in Sumer and the surrounding regions. The first fragment of the text, which is largely believed to date back at least 4,000 years, was found in the early 1900s by Hermann Hilbrecht at the site of ancient Nippur, with its discovery subsequently published in 1906. Since Hilbrecht's discovery, at least 18 other fragments of the list have been found, most of them dating from the second half of the Isin dynasty. Yet this controversial claim of past rulers' ages is a reoccurring theme with many of these fragments, reiterating these incredibly long lifespans. Furthermore, intriguingly, the Epic of Gilgamesh, perhaps the most famous, still surviving contribution to world history dating back to Mesopotamia, is depicted as nothing short of a giant. Often depicted, carrying what is perceived as his pet lion, the cat, however, appears far from tame, attempting to take a chunk from his arm, but due to Gilgamesh's relative size to his furry friend, merely appears as nothing more than a kitten when in his embrace. Could these claims of a 20,000-year lifespan be connected to the additional claim of many of the figures from this era's incredible sizes? Could heavy research and a subsequent in-depth expose regarding the reality surrounding the claims of the Mesopotamian civilization finally confirm the past existence of not only giants, but human beings, whom, after their derivation from divinity, initially had lifespans stretching into 30,000 years? For as the list states, and I quote, After the kingship descended from heaven, they were situated within Eridung in Alulim. It is named after Eridung, who became king. He ruled for 28,800 years, with Alijar subsequently ruling for 36,000 years after him. Two kings who ruled for 64,800 years." End quote. As one would predict, such claims are simply dismissed by academics the world over. This is, of course, due to the tales of the king's immense longevity, and due to their own paradigms, one they are often funded to regurgitate, would have simply been impossibility. Additionally, along with this staunch denial to even consider such possibilities within mainstream study, this same fate befalls the countless, gigantic, unexplained megaliths found the world over. This is a clear example of how valuable academia perceives their illusionary, oracle-esque all-knowing regarding a complete history of human civilization. For if one was to consider such past individuals, having been responsible for the Great Pyramids for example, one could finally explain how, and indeed who, accomplished such ancient feats. But I digress. Could Mesopotamia be the key to unlocking many secrets hidden or lost within human history? We find such possibilities as highly compelling. The Terracotta Army – undoubtedly the most astonishing collection of carvings, whether mold-based or not, to be found anywhere on Earth. The artistic genius on display within this large terracotta army is hard to ignore when, according to academia, they were merely the handiwork of untrained slaves. Not only does the army display an immense level of detail and thus artistic talent, they are also all seemingly unique, as if each soldier was an accurate recreation of an ancient individual in full armor. We have, in the past, covered this astonishing discovery discussing how the temple in which this army is said to be protecting has supposedly never been opened, this even though upon excavating the original entranceways, sophisticated crossbows tipped with poison arrows were found left each on a butterfly trigger like something straight out of an Indiana Jones movie, 
whatever these elaborate defenses were protecting has, according to Chinese authorities, never been explored. What's more, this same notoriously secret government have also made any future digs illegal, quashing all hopes for anyone who would like to know about this clearly intriguing section of history. However, these incredible features, along with the soldiers' average giant sizes, were not the only area of study we have explored regarding the army. In our first video regarding the amazing site, we explored the highly mysterious monoatomic pigment that was found on many of the statues, popularly known as Han Purple. This astonishingly complex pigment, although apparently sourced and manufactured in enormous amounts by a far less capable, more primitive ancestor, was not fully understood until the 1990s. A pigment that, according to scientists who have studied it, exhibits characteristics of, quote, an element of a lower dimension, end quote, and as such, according to mainstream paradigm, is an incredibly difficult artifact to explain. Yet, Han purple is not the only incredible, highly enigmatic pigment dating from a now lost antiquity. There also exists another, no less impressive pigment, which is highly likely to have originated within the now lost civilization we like to call the Pyramid Builders. Known as Egyptian Blue, this marvelous pigment was found during an investigation by the British Museum. The Parthenon marbles, also known as the Elgin marbles, are a collection of classic Greek marble statues, whose history, although heavily documented, display upon their surface not only evidence of an advanced ancient knowledge, most probably a leftover, still in circulation within top masons and sculptors around the time of the statue's creation. But this pigment, found during an in-depth investigation of the marbles, to discover whether they were once painted or not, was found in varying quantities upon their varying features, not only subsequently proving beyond doubt that the statues were indeed once painted, but like that of Han purple within China, Egyptian blue also has a highly curious characteristic discovered by modern technology. It is not only the sole surviving pigment on the statues, but is only visible within the infrared spectrum, a band invisible to the human eye. Made under the supervision of the architect and sculptor, Phidias and his assistants, the origin of the pigment, however, just like that of Han purple, is unknown. Where did the knowledge for creating this pigment come from? Why is it now lost? Why does it emit colors invisible to the modern man's eye? We find not only Egyptian blue's infrared characteristics, but also Han Purple's intriguing dimensionally deficient resonance as highly compelling. The ancient ruins of Egypt regardless of their astonishing characteristics or the often enormous megalithic building blocks used in the site's construction, are still claimed by an academia with no explanation as to how, as the work of our well-studied yet far more recent ancestors, the Egyptians. It is one of the most crucial ancient locations when it comes to exposing the conspiratorial nature of academia, a denial of the obvious by those who were faithfully tasked with explaining the origins of said sites, or indeed how said sites were created. Any of these long-awaited answers, however, remain elusive. For in reality, no one knows who built the ancient pyramids of Giza, how they did it, when they did it, or indeed why. We simply cannot explain how these feats of engineering and architecture were accomplished. For although such ruins are claimed as a particular group's work, there is no logical reasoning that can be provided to confirm this claim. Additionally, there are many other, no less gigantic megalithic blocks which can be found throughout Egypt, often found used within the many temples, but also seen buried, concealed within the foundations, which make up part of the floor at the pyramid's bases. And Dendera Temple is of no exception. We have covered the temple in the past, focusing on an intriguing depiction which many have come to conclude depicts a lost lighting technology. Some individuals have now created working replicas of this intriguing device. We have also covered the steps found within the temple, 
these steps appear to have been melted at some point in the past, rather than simple entropy. The temple, however, possesses many more inexplicable secrets, all concealed from the majority of Earth's population by a field of study that firstly lacks any demonstrative evidence, but also due to the evidence which one can mount to support the positive past stone-cutting power technology having once existed, thus these features are effectively ignored and thus largely overlooked. Copper chisels cannot explain its existence. People who have explored the temple have found that the repeating reliefs within are perfectly symmetrical identical in form to within millimeters of each other. The leaching of salts between surfaces are the only reasons we can see the joints in the Great Hall. Furthermore, Chris Dunn, a fellow antiquarian, has explored these intriguing clues within Dendera Temple previously. Not only did the precision of the carving stun Chris Dunn, but the finish upon such a brittle stone has led Chris to conclude that high technology was once utilized to create the stone carvings. Who built Dendera? What technologies were used to construct the temple? Or indeed, ancient Egypt as a whole? Dendera is undoubtedly a jewel in the crown, a now lost antiquity, one which we find highly compelling. We regularly cover the countless gigantic ancient megaliths which can fortunately still be found within the ruins of antiquity all over the world. Enigmatic, often inexplicable relics of a forgotten age that, due to their controversial existence, are either ignored by mainstream funded explorations, subsequently obscured, overlooked by the greater world, or simply attributed to a culture once incapable of such undertakings. Once one is presented with the facts regarding these building blocks, their weights, the precision of the original execution, and the many other characteristics which elude academic explanation, it is easy to see why an academic world who continue to refuse even the smallest consideration in regards to the possibility of a lost chapter of human history this regardless of the fact that said artifacts are rather ironically all undeniable evidence for their existence. One cannot only discover the motivation behind such denials, but the many tactics used to dodge such areas of study. For not only do we regularly explore these incredible megalithic legacies, but they are all too often attributed to a more recent, permitted, and thus funded, subsequently well-studied periods of ancestry. And our next item of interest is of no exception. We have in the past covered a number of the astonishing ancient megaliths that can be found dotting ancient Egypt, the Colossus of Memnon, which apparently once sung at night, each car from a single block of granite and each weighing in at over 1,000 tons. We have exposed the enormous stones which form the Great Pyramid's inner skeletons, along with many others found across the plateau and beyond all of which tell of a lost knowledge and capability, unquestionably indicative of advanced ancient civilization. Pompeii's Pillar, located within Alexandria, is truly one of the wonders of the ancient world. One of the largest monoliths on Earth, 20 meters in height and with a diameter of nearly 3 meters at its base, this enormous column was once sourced and carved from one single block of Aswan Quarry's pink granite, and it is estimated to weigh an impressive 290 tons. Anyone within heavy goods, modern construction, will understand just how massive this pillar is, and indeed, just what an incredible feat it was for this ancient civilization to have once created such architecture. Pompeii's pillar is so big that to claim such accomplishments were made within the Roman era or before, when even modern man has great difficulty moving such weights, even the smallest of distances, we feel is preposterous. Like that of the obelisk of Axum, which was unfortunately toppled, giving the obelisk its modern title of the toppled obelisk. This monolith is estimated to have weighed far more, yet was once erected somehow by an ancient ancestor. However, we feel, although at some time within the past, a concerted effort to destroy this legacy was undertaken. The pillar's enormous base made toppling it impossible 
by a later, less capable culture. Muslim traveler Ibn Patuta visited Alexandria in 1326 AD, having shot an arrow tied to a string over the pillar, he successfully climbed over it. He was later followed in early 1803 by British commander John Shortland of HMS Pandur. After he flew a kite over the pillar, again successfully getting a rope over it, on February 2nd, he and John White, Pandur's master, climbed it. When they got to the top, they displayed a union jack, drank a toast to King George III, and gave three cheers. Four days later they would climb the pillar again, after fixing a weather vane, they ate a beefsteak and again toasted the king. Who built Pompey's pillar? How did they move and erect it? Is this pillar the only surviving remnant of a past, enormous ancient structure? Or merely a single standing column? And if so, why? Why create just one pillar? Pompey's pillar is undoubtedly an amazing relic, left to us from a bygone era, and as such, highly compelling. Lajedo de Paimatus, located within modern-day Brazil, is an incredible ancient site that, just like Gornia Shoria within Russia, is of such a tremendous age and the stones incorporated into its structure are of such a huge size that mainstream academics passionately attest to the site being merely geological. However, the megalithic wall located at the site, which is uncannily similar to many others, each claimed as geological, yet the symmetry in the construction, the fact that the blocks are placed in what we now call stretcher courses, is a technique which can be seen within brick-built buildings all over the world. This unnatural, repetitive technique makes the walls the strongest possible, using single-layer blocks to build with. It is highly unlikely that this repeating pattern would appear naturally. However, there are many other features at the site that not only prove it was indeed an ancient settlement, now all but eroded back to nature, dolmens of a similar age which litter the site are arguably proof of an artificial origin exposing what we have long claimed to have been a reality, that a now hidden civilization's ruins are being actively dismissed as nothing more than geological features. The site is approximately 1.5 square kilometers and is home to about 100 large rounded stones, each weighing up to 45 tons. Some of these stones have been placed upon tiny base stones, and others have seemingly been hollowed out from the base, making what is unquestionably some of the most intriguing ancient dolmens to be found anywhere on Earth. According to geologists who have explored the site, yet have seemingly ignored the evidence to suggest that many of these stones have artificial origins, the rock formation is the result of soil wear over millions of years due to natural cracks and large temperature variations. As aforementioned, the most curious and seemingly most famous block is the hollowed-out dolmen, which is commonly known as the helmet stone. Additionally, along with the Neolithic dolmens which litter the site, on some of the stones there are cave paintings, which are attributed to the Kareri Indians who lived in the region about 12,000 years ago. Legend has it that later, the site became the home of someone known as the Hermit Healer, an individual claimed to have lived in the region in around the 18th century. Many people from this area sought his consult, yet any concrete evidence as to who this individual was, or what they were capable of, has eluded modern understandings. We feel that due to the stretcher courses found within the megalithic wall, currently claimed as a natural formation, along with the evidence at the site of Neolithic dolmens, with surviving art which also dates from this era, are all compelling proofs of an artificial, advanced, yet ancient and now hidden origin. Who built Legedo de Paimatus? What was the site's original purpose? Just how old is Legedo de Paimatus? Thankfully, the more people who explore the site and collect and compile photographic studies, the closer we will get to finally answering these burning questions regarding our past. It is a site which we find highly compelling.